All right. All right. <laughs> stop. Okay. All right. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the meeting of the Plymouth School Committee. It's seven o'clock, and the meeting is called to order. If you'll please join me for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Welcome, everybody, on this freezing cold day. Um, we are going to do comments from the public first today. And I believe we have five... Hold on. Uh, we have five speakers today, so we'll go ahead and get started with our speakers. I think that they're all here. First, we have Lauren Nisrella. Lauren, are you there? She's not there. Oh, no. you're not there? Okay, we'll move on to the next one, and then we can go back. Shannon Malone. Is Shannon here? Hi, that's me. Hi, Shannon. All right. First off, I'd like to say so much. Uh, thank you so much for your time and allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, all right, so my name is Shannon Malone and I'm a senior at Plymouth North. Uh, a lot of people say that your senior year is supposed to be the most eventful and the best year of high school, aside from like college anxiety and all. Um, but that changed for almost everyone last March. Uh, but losing all of that was a trade-off. So every student in this school district has had to make a trade-off this year to take precautions in favor of the health of their parents, their families, their friends, and all of their loved ones. But yet even with those precautions, such as some students going full remote for the year, participating in a hybrid model, there has been spread in sickness and struggle and pain. For some, there's even been death. Earlier this February, my mother was hospitalized. After a week long struggle with what we thought was a worsening infection, turned out to be COVID with pneumonia, she was admitted to Beth Israel. And I'm not gonna sit here and tell you how scary that was for me, thinking that my mother could have died knowing the pain that she was in. But I'm gonna tell you about the guilt that I felt just a couple of weeks before, one of my teachers tested positive for COVID. And shortly after my mother was hospitalized, two of my friends who were also in that teacher's class became positive. I was so sure that I had been the one to give my mother this illness and that I got it from school. But even though I tested negative and that she recovered from the worst of it, I still felt so incredibly guilty about it. But that guilt's not on me. No student should have to think about choosing between passing school and transmitting this disease to their loved ones. That guilt's not on me, it's not on us, and it's not on anyone in the school district. So I ask you to consider remaining hybrid and following proper distancing guidelines for as long as possible, at least until vaccinations are more accessible for all of us, because no one should have to feel that guilt, not students, not teachers, not anyone in the administration. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Shannon. Okay, next we have Sophia. Hi. Sophia DeCola, right? Okay, hello, my name is Sophia DeCola and I am a junior at Plymouth North High School. From a student's point of view, returning to full in-person learning in the current state of the pandemic will create unnecessary risks to teachers and students' physical and mental health. These risks are not justified by the rewards of attending school five days a week. By sending more than 1,000 unvaccinated high school kids back to school would be a significant increase in the opportunities for in-school transmission, majorly disrupting students' education. In the current hybrid model, distancing requirements are, are not strictly enforced, students are often seen incorrectly wearing masks, and contact tracing efforts are minimal. The spread of COVID has been more present in the high schools than what the administration has tracked. What is being presented as a return to normalcy is rushing to put students in situations where COVID is highly likely to spread faster. The least this will do for students is that they could fail or miss their sports season, but at the most, they could experience the death of a loved one or a member of the student body or faculty. We should not have to go to school afraid of everyone around us. Pandemic fatigue has affected us all 
and students and faculty have endured it like no other. It has hurt the mental health of the student body, myself included. Distrust in our fellow peers has become a struggle we face this year, as not all students have made the safest choices outside of school. Plymouth Public Schools may not feel responsible for the students' decisions, but we, those who go to school with them in the same building, are. Doubling the number of students is a lot more people to keep track of and trust their decisions. If the person I sit next to in my math class gets COVID outside of school, they're no longer just responsible for themselves. Whether or not the school feels responsible, the transmission is a possibility in school now and extremely likely if fully, person, if fully in-person learning is implemented. It has hurt our relationships and, and will continue to. When a large gathering over winter break led to an outbreak of COVID cases, it was widely known throughout the student body who attended it before returning to school after break. None received repercussions for putting themselves and others in danger and contact tracing wasn't even considered to see the effect of the event. We cannot expect our student body to take COVID seriously if the administration doesn't either. This led to a fully remote model for a week where myself and others struggled immensely with fully remote, sorry, with our mental health from switching routines. Switching routines is a big deal to students who haven't had consistency since last March. While the hybrid system may not be perfect, it is routine students are beginning to accommodate to, and to take that away from them will be harmful to the mental health of me and many other students who are struggling with the lack of consistency in routine. If there's another gathering during April break and the full student body returns, do we have to shut down again? Does the school take responsibility for its students' choices or do we just let it slide again? Do we keep switching routines for the next two months and just let the students suffer? Do we claim that returning to full in-person will help mental health while fear and anxiety surrounding COVID heightens when going five days a week? Students endure enough stress as it is in a normal school year, and this year is far from normal. From a member of the student body, returning to fully in-person learning will harm more than it will help. We should focus on supporting students in the hybrid model until a majority of the teachers are vaccinated and the student body has begun to receive vaccines. Along with this, proper and effective contact tracing methods should be put into effect in the schools and tested before return to full in-person for the safety of the students, teachers, and families. Looking at what we have been through and what threats lie ahead, I hope you will consider remaining in a hybrid model for the time being and revisit a full return for the late spring. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sylvia. Okay. Um, next, we have Eliza Mayo. Hi, my name is Eliza Mayo and I'm a senior at Plymouth North High School. As a student, I wanted to express how strongly opposed I am to returning to school full time. I do not feel safe with the new three feet distancing as it directly violates the CDC guidelines. We need to remember that while wearing masks makes a huge difference in containing the spread, they are not 100% effective. And COVID-19 can linger in the air for up to three hours. As someone who caught COVID in school while wearing a mask and staying six feet apart from others, I wanna articulate the increased risk this poses to the students and faculty of Plymouth North. I still have lingering effects from COVID and has been over a month since I contracted the virus. And I also do not know what other effects may emerge in the future. We do not have enough information on the long-term impact, long impacts of COVID and how the virus is spreading and the potential variants to send students back full time. Because of the two day incubation period and the wide variety of symptoms, many students are also unknowingly coming to school with COVID, myself included. Is it really worth jeopardizing the health and the safety of both students and their families? The decision should go, to go back should be left in the hands of the experts like the CDC, and we should wait until more people have been vaccinated. If we go back full time, many students would have to self isolate for at least seven days if exposed to someone in their class who has COVID due to the three feet distancing. If one student goes to school with COVID, at least 64 students would have to self isolate. As someone who has taken four, AP, is taking four APs in all honors classes, I cannot imagine having to miss five days of school. This system would set us students up to fail and could cause many to fall behind. As much as I would love to finish off my senior year in person and see my friends in the other cohort, it is not worth it worth risking my health, my family's safety, or my education. I urge the Plymouth Public School system to listen to the students as we are the ones who will face the consequences of this decision. The safety of hundreds of students rests in your hands, so please don't take this decision lightly. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. Okay, next up we have Owen Mayo. Hi, hold up, I'm, uh, I have something written in my notes. Wait, can you still see me? Nope. Oh, you can't? Uh, hold on, all right, I remember most of it. Okay, um, so my name's Owen, I'm in 10th grade. Um, basically, in a number of my classes, I see students wearing their masks below their noses and most teachers will say, oh, like put it 
above your nose and stuff. But uh, in a lot of cases, the teachers aren't enforcing the masks. And I've also seen staff members who don't wear their masks above their noses. So basically, my main concern is that why should we go back into a full in-person model when the administration doesn't enforce a lot of the students and even some of the staff members to wear their masks over their noses? I think it's unsafe to students and teachers with uh, who are actually at risk and uh, care about other people's safety. I don't think it's fair. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. And do we have Lauren? Yes. Okay. Lauren Nasrallah? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I hope this message finds you well. My name is Lauren Nestrella. I'm a senior at North and I love being at school more than anyone. When the shutdown happened last March, I started crying in math, knowing I wouldn't be at school for two weeks. My heart still wants to be at school. However, science urges us that we wait to return to full in-person learning until we are vexed. The true implications of COVID-19 on adolescents' brains and respiratory systems is unknown. Yes, we have a lower death rate, but we still experience excruciating symptoms such as migraines, trouble breathing, exhaustion, loss of taste, and brain fog. And as, a, as an epidemiologist at UMass has reported on behalf of a Massachusetts study, young people in Massachusetts spread COVID the most. And since our schools don't have the capacity to keep us all six feet apart, whenever someone near us reports having COVID, we will have to quarantine alone in our bedrooms for a week. As a student of three APs in honors classes, I can't imagine missing in-person instruction for five whole school days. I also know that because of the anxiety and stress that will come with missing so much school, many kids will still come to school who are supposed to be quarantining just like we saw after winter break. While trying to navigate our schoolwork, as well as not being able to go to work or community service, on top of that, I will deal with the same anxiety and fear of losing a loved one again. Getting COVID is a huge risk for death for my dad and many others. He recently had open heart surgery and won't be receiving the vax until May. When he received this surgery one month ago, every time he coughed, he had to hold a pillow so he wouldn't put too much strain on his heart. Unfortunately, there are many other schools at school who have parents receiving this same surgery, as well as other major treatments. Can you imagine if my dad or any of them gets COVID? I understand that Plymouth Public Schools is concerned about our mental health. But I promise you that if we lose our fathers or our mothers, our lives will deteriorate. As our town's website states, this is a crucial time in infection control. Maintaining social distancing, limiting exposure to others, avoiding crowded places, etc., are vital steps in slowing the spread of this disease. We have been in this pandemic for so long. I know you're sick of it, I am too, but we are so close. And if we go back after April break, it will only extend the time until we're safe and place our futures in harm's way. Why would we do this for less than two months of school with our unvaccinated parents, our unvaccinated selves, and without a vaccination for people under 16? We need to wait as long as possible. How are we supposed to teach the importance of science and ethics when our education system will be denying both of these things to us. Please center your decision on facts and morals. It will save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, all students today, thank you. Great job, guys. All right, so now we will go to our student representatives. And who do we have today? We have Christopher and Karen. Are you guys gonna do separately or together? Um, we're gonna do separately because okay. Maggie's also here, so we're gonna do oh. it together. Oh, Maggie, North. I'm sorry. I only looked at the top row. Um, all right, so why don't we go to Plymouth North first? Okay, I'll just share my screen. Um, hold on. Oh, 
Sorry, everything's so slow today. There you go. So here are updates for this week. Um, for DECA, one of our students, Bella Harvey, won the Emerging Leaders Award for her service to DECA along with her stellar academics. And she was the only winner that was from the South Shore this week. So we thought it was important to highlight. My, my mic was off. Term three will be closing on Friday, April 9th. So make sure you are looking, looking on Aspen for any missing work. Good try. I was gonna say, Karen, you got this. <laughs> oh, Karen, you muted. Okay, perfect. Going solo. Okay, Skills USA. 18 students from North medaled in the Skills USA competition, the written portion, and five were golden medals. Let's see if I can present. For the VPA, Spectrum placed third and Northern Lights in first place for the, oh, first in the quarterfinals of the International Championship of Acapella. Uh, Maggie also said she was removed by the host. We'll get her back, if we'll she, get her back if in. Comes back in, we'll get her in. Karen, can she get back in? She cannot. Should I just continue? Um, yes, please. And maybe just have her keep trying. Okay, so term three report cards will go out on Friday, April 16th. April 2nd, the deadline seniors were reminded that there is a deadline to turn in the NI scholarship and student aid report for the FAFSA. Please let Mrs. Scallon of you know what school you'll be attending or what career major, along with all the copies of the financial aid packages that have been received. College admissions, um, the panel webinar is on March 31st at 6.30 p.m. Admissions representatives from UC San Diego, Province, UMass Amherst, Quinnipiac will be giving presentations. This is really important for any upcoming juniors and seniors. Um, for fall two sports, fall two sports are well underway with athletes competing in track, football, dance, cheer, and unified basketball. Um, these are the upcoming games. On the 19th, football will be playing at Hingham. On the 16th, unified basketball at South. And next month on the 7th, track will be playing versus um, running against Silver Lake. And for North Student Council, so the Polar Plunge was on March 27th, will be on March 27th. And on the Instagram for Plymouth North Student Council, they've been highlighting women throughout um, Women's History Month and also to follow the Instagram and Twitter at pnhs.stuco. Um, here are some important reminders. Senior dates have been released in an email 
and also check emails out for surveys as Mr. Parslin has been sending out a few um, this past few weeks. Junior's SAT date is on March 24th um, and both silver and blue cohort will be testing on the same day. And um, to conclude, um, Maggie and I obviously are much different than Alex and I, um, but I wanted to end off with a poem um, inspired by Amanda Gorman. I just want to say for Women's History Month, I'm so incredibly proud of all the girls um, and Owen that have spoken today. Um, they're very strong. They are also very inspiring and I appreciate and I'm so proud of all of them. So the road not taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry, I could not travel both. And one and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trod in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads, leads on to way, I doubt it if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And sorry, Maggie, that we lost you, but that was wonderful. Oh, you're back. Maggie, did you want to end it? Um, did you want to add anything before we go on to Plymouth South? Uh, I have nothing else to add, but thank you. All right, we're sorry that we lost you, but you guys put together a great presentation. Oh, she's gone again. All right, it looks like we've got Christopher and we, we have Alexandra as well. Are you guys doing it together or are you just doing it on your own, Christopher? Uh, yeah, I think Alex just came to oh, great. give some peer support. All right, so okay. we have Plymouth South. Thanks. Okay, here we go. Sweet. Okay, so this is Plymouth South March updates. Um, so for Poetry Out Loud, every year PSHS students work with English teachers to memorize and present a poem for the annual Poetry Out Loud competition. After making it through three rounds at the school level, senior Casey McPherson was named Plymouth South's representative at the Eastern Regional Party uh, Poetry Out Loud competition and is now moving on to the state finals after a successful performance last Sunday. Uh, for our PH PSHS Theater Guild, uh, they presented their second radio play of the year, Help Desk. This is a play by Don Zalidis. Uh, it takes a hilarious look at customer service calls from asking for help with a credit card charge to therapy puppets. This show tackles it all. So great job to students and staff for their continued creativity during the year. For acapella, over the weekend, our acapella group South Ave competed in the international competition for high school acapella. Usually performed live, this year's competition consisted of groups creating their own music videos and submitting them for adjudication. Uh, the video South Ave submitted was entirely student produced and swept the awards Friday night with Samantha uh, Bisson winning awards for best arrangement and best audio mix and Greg Jesse winning for best choreography. So thank you to all students, staff and custodial staff, their efforts as it was filmed in the halls of South After Hours so check out our school social media pages to view the video. Um, and we'll be airing this during advisory this week for all students to see. So congratulations to all our vocal performers. Some news for seniors. Uh, due to cancellation of Oktoberfest, PSHS will be hosting a spring fest for each cohort in its place, uh, March 22nd for cohort A and March 29th for cohort B. So thank you to all local businesses as well who have donated uh, to the event, including a hot cocoa truck from Stephen Co. And seniors will also receive their senior t-shirt at this event and all events will be following proper COVID uh, guidelines. And a senior parent newsletter was sent to families with updated events for seniors. So make sure to take a look um, 
on, at that and more events will be added in the days and weeks ahead. And the deadline for senior yard signs is this Friday. For sports, after a successful winter season, fall two sports have started at PSHS for football, cheer, dance, and winter track. In addition, Unified Basketball has their first game against North tomorrow at 3 p.m. at South. Uh, congratulations to the football team for their first win on Friday night. Uh, spring sports will begin officially April 26, and more information should be forthcoming from the MIAA regarding end of season tournaments. SATs. Our juniors will have the opportunity to take their SATs during the school day on March 24th for cohort A and April 13th for cohort B. This testing will take place in the gym and students will report directly to this location the morning of the test as it is on their learn, home, uh, learn from home day. So this week is our March Madness week. Uh, we have spirit days. Uh, we're doing tomorrow is Hawaiian shirt day as well as Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday are college like apparel day. So yeah, and then tomorrow is our Moe's Southwest Grill fundraiser. So if you go to Moe's tomorrow and say that you're there for the Plymouth South fundraiser, proceeds will go to funding uh, Plymouth South High's student council. Uh, news for the Freshman Academy. Congrats to Academy Students of the Month of uh, February to Boston Robertson and David Tricorico. Also Remote Monday Students of the Month, Kenzie Muratori and Nostradamus Wood. Skills USA, 78 Plymouth South uh, students competed in the Skills USA district competition. Students from across all our vocational programs competed in competition related to their shop areas. Many students received gold, silver, and bronze honors. So great job to all those involved. And finally, the Plymouth South High School community came together on Friday, March 5th to celebrate the lives of two of our staff members who we lost to pancreatic cancer. Staff and students were encouraged to wear purple in support of the awareness of this terrible disease. Over $730 was raised and donated to the American Cancer Society in memory of these wonderful colleagues. So please check out our social media pages for pictures of the celebration in their memory. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you to all the students. Does anybody have any questions or comments for the students today? Great, good. All right, thank you guys. As always, you did an amazing job. Thank you. Okay, so moving right along, we are going to go right into our um, district preparedness update with COVID-19. Dr. Campbell. Thank you very much, Ms. Savory. I'm gonna share my screen so that EdTV can project the presentation put my glasses on so I can see. <laughs> so again, good evening. I just want to start by thanking um, all of our families, our faculty, our staff, our high school students um, for the tremendous feedback that they've provided us over the last two weeks to prepare for this evening. So a lot of information has been shared with us in the two week period. We've been very busy processing many documents from the state as well as the incredible amount of survey data we received from all of our stakeholders. And I'll be sharing that all tonight during my presentation. We have, so we, we have a lot, so let's begin and I'll get going here. So this evening I'll be reviewing our local health metrics, share findings from medical experts related to distancing in classrooms, provide an update from Commissioner Riley's office and the Board of Education share our survey results from families, staff, and our high school students, and then uh, end with some recommendations and um, of course, questions and comments along the way. And please stop me along the way if you have any questions. I'd like to stop. Yeah, so this, <coughs> this slide here is another COVID trend chart provided by Dr. Podfin. As you can see, Plymouth's average daily cases have been on a steady decline since January, so which is encouraging. As you can see from these two risk assessment maps from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Massachusetts has shown significant progress in the same period of time. In fact, as of March 11th, I believe there were only 14 communities in the entire Commonwealth that were still considered high risk. Plymouth is not one of them currently. Our most recent percent positivity rate was 3.13%, which, which was lower than the last reporting period. So recently, Commissioner Riley 
from the Department of Education shared a letter he received from infectious disease physicians, pediatricians, and public health experts. This letter was included um, in the documents that I shared with you. It was signed by over 300 medical experts. The letter highlighted the broad effective mitigation measures in place in schools across the Commonwealth, and these experts definitively state that when such measures are in place with students masked, spacing between students can be as little as three feet to increase in-person learning. That letter goes on to highlight that Massachusetts private and public schools have opened with as little as three feet of distance between students successfully. These experts assigned this letter went on to stress that the risk to students of not being in school are dramatic and that every effort must be made to return students to in-person education as a matter of public health importance. And again, I've included a copy of that letter um, for your reference. So you may recall in the Department of Ed's initial fall school reopening guidance, which, which was issued back in June, June 25th to be exact, physical distancing was referenced in many locations. And as we all know, physical distancing is an important practice that helps mitigate transmission of the virus. So while the CDC has recommended maintaining a physical distance of six feet between individuals, the World Health Organization's guidance states approximately three feet. DESE encourages districts and schools to aim for six feet of distance between individuals when feasible. At the same time, a minimum physical distance of three feet has been established when combined with the other measures and safety requirements. Department of Ed states that because of the reduced susceptibility of children and lower apparent transmission rates, establishing a minimum physical distance of three feet informed by evidence and balance of lower risk of COVID-19 transmission and the overarching benefits of in-school learning. So in the department's initial guidance, there is reference to the Lancet study. This study identified 172 observational studies across 16 countries and six continents and 14 relative comparative studies in healthcare and non-healthcare settings. And they concluded that transmission of the virus was lower with physical distancing of one meter or more, which is about 3.3 inches. Um, so I just wanted to reference that that was shared by the commissioner recently and in the guidance. Um, also included among the documents that I shared with you uh, for this evening's presentation um, is a study that was led by researchers at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. These findings were actually um, published last week in the Journal of Clinical Infectious Disease. So using data and this is, this is a local study. So using data from 251 school districts in Massachusetts, the study examined the social distancing policy between students and schools across the state to see if it made a difference to keep them six feet or three feet apart. The researchers compared the rates of COVID-19 cases in students and staff in Massachusetts public schools among districts where universal mask mandates but different physical distancing requirements were in place. So the scientists found no significant difference in the rate of COVID-19 cases among students and staff in districts that mandated six feet of distancing versus districts that mandated three feet of distancing. So the researchers used data from 251 school districts encompassing more than 537,000 students and nearly 100,000 staff members who attended in-person instruction during a 16 week uh, period from starting in September up th to January of 2021. So the findings of, uh, are important because they suggest that lower physical distancing policies can be adapted in schools with masking mandates um, uh, without negatively impacting students or staff safety. Um, and this was according to uh, the lead author, Dr. Pauli Van Denberg, who's a fellow at the Division of Infectious Disease at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. So. The team's findings also show that in general, schools had lower overall rate of infection than their surrounding communities. Lend, lead, lending, excuse me, lending support to the idea that in-person learning is not a major driver of the pandemic. However, district case rates were tightly linked to those of the community, particularly among staff. So I, I wanted to include this slide because uh, I wanted to take a moment to assure the public that we have done everything recommended by the CDC and the Department of Education related to ventilation, cleaning, and sanitization, and air filtration. So 
Um, as, as you all know, we've increased our filtration by upgrading filters to MERV 13, so I've learned a lot about filters over the last several months, but these are hospital grade filters. So we're changing these out um, every three months, so as soon as those filters come in, we change them every 90 days. It's not something that is required, but we just, up, we've, we have, um, we've decided to do that. Um, we've installed air purification devices in every unit. They purify the pollutants at the source, causing the particles to stick together, so they're filtered out. Uh, and we're maximizing the air intake, which is important, the fresh air intake to extend, uh, to the extent possible, while still maintaining proper uh, air, air temperatures. So that's what we're doing in the buildings with the HVAC. Now, we know that we have buildings without HVAC. So in those buildings, we've purchased hundreds of box fans for air circulation, as well as hundreds of very sophisticated air purification systems. These systems are in classrooms, in every classroom, in fact, in a school that does not have HVAC, and instructional spaces, and hallways in schools, in large spaces without forced ventilation. We also encourage the windows to maintain open slightly for air exchange, and when the warmer weather comes, we'll be opening those windows like we did in the fall, putting the box fans back in. But these really, uh, these, these, these uh, sophisticated systems do three things. They, 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 they are reducing surface and air contaminants through ionization, again, reducing the particles and airborne pollutants. It's, it's, it has a sophisticated level of filtration, and also has this what's called an active pure technology, which creates and propels safe disinfecting molecules into the air, which seek and destroy pathogens. So we, we have those on um, uh, um, in a daytime use, and then when the buildings are closed, we have them on a more sophisticated um, uh, method for when schools are closed. So I just wanted to stress that with the community. Uh, Commissioner Riley held another meeting with superintendents on March 10th of last week to go over his phase mandate to shift away from remote and hybrid and begin a fuller return to in-person learning. So during this Zoom meeting, the commissioner stated that COVID-19 numbers are going down, vaccine numbers are going up, and the Department of Education feels at this time to go is, that we should be going back to school at a three-foot distance when, when necessary. Commissioner Riley also stated that in his recommendation, it is supported by Dr. Fauci, who stated that the state plan was both practical and realistic. These were the words from the commissioner last week. The commissioner again stated that three, the three-foot mark in the fall was determined based on information from the Lancet report, the Lancet study, which I mentioned before, as well as new data that's coming out, um, which I talked about, that Massachusetts study specifically. So the commissioner has approached this new mandate in a phased approach, allowing districts time to prepare. Again, this is to allow us time to prepare. So phase one is requiring all elementary students back no later than April 5th. Phase two would be requiring grades six to eight to go back no later than April 28th. And phase three for high school is still forthcoming. The commissioner stated though, that he will let districts know in April and give us two weeks notice but we should, prepare, we should prepare all students for a full return. Again, this is the commissioner's words. Uh, the commissioner also told districts to survey families, which we've done, um, to give a choice for our in-person or remote learning. He stated the districts will need to figure out how to service families that choose remote, but also stressed that in most cases, students going remote at this point of the year may not have the same experience or the same teacher. Um, and I'll address that in my next slide. But one thing that is also important that these regulations are binding, meaning that any district that does not comply with them will be required to make up any missed structured learning time, which could include summer or even next fall if we decided not to, to follow that. Okay. So as I said in the last slide, um, these, change, these changes, uh, will, w districts will no longer be allowed once they're in place to, to um, engage in a hybrid or remote learning model without the authorization of this, uh, the state. They're, these regulations are binding. Having said that, families may continue to keep their children in their current remote model if they choose without penalty. It uh, doesn't apply to family situations. In addition, if families do not want their children to go full-time, they may elect for remote learning. So these remote options, however, will be very, very limited, as I said, which the commissioner understands as well. So for our K-6 families, 
they could elect to go into our existing remote academy that we established in the summer. And for students in grades 7 to 12, we would only have the avail availability of edge annuity for any additional families. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to get into great detail um, to the, to the, um, regarding our survey data. So over the last two weeks, we've co we have conducted four separate surveys. So first, on March 2nd, we shared a return to school initial intention survey with families to get a sense of whether families would choose to send their children to school five days a week or go remote, understanding that there's really no other option that would be able, we would be able to provide. So I'll be reviewing the results of that survey first this evening in a moment. Uh, last week, in an effort to learn more about what our stakeholders are thinking and feeling, we initiated three additional surveys to gauge our staff, our families, and our high school students in terms of their impressions, their concerns, their level of optimism, among other things. So collectively, from these four surveys, we have received 9,502 individual responses and an additional 9,394 individual comments. So we've spent a lot of time going over this administratively and I spent a lot of time over the weekend, but I um, will first present the general responses, the, the general questions were asked, <coughs> and then address the comments which we've grouped into themes and trends, which I'll share with all of you at near the end, okay? So the slide that you see um, here before you is, uh, this is the breakdown of the first survey that we deployed, okay? These are the results as of Friday, last Friday afternoon. We left the survey open through today so that we could capture additional responses, particularly for our elementary families where we already have a plan for. So as you can see, we've received a, a response rate in Friday about 48%, 40% uh, 40 of 48% of our students. So of the 3,474 responses, 3,252 stated that their children would be attending full person learning or 93.6%. That elementary number has gone up since then. Um, there were eight families among the elementary responses that stated that they would prefer to go remote. However, as the principals be began to contact those families, uh, they discovered that several of them had mistakenly responded incorrectly and they had no intention of the child leaving at this time. Of the 1,702 secondary responses, <coughs> excuse me, 94% said that they would elect full in-person learning and 6% or 107 stated that they would choose to go remote if the district would return to in-person learning five days a week. This, of course, would need to be confirmed on a case-by-case -case basis with administration and with our guidance. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, an additional, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> losing my voice, an additional family survey was sent out a week ago asking participants to respond to a number of conditions, such as their level of optimism, general concern, as well as concern for the child's social emotional well-being. So there were also several opportunities to provide uh, specific feedback in relation to these questions as well as a general comment box. So I'm going to go over those right now, okay? So when elementary families were recently asked <coughs> if their child would be returning to full person learning, 93.7% said yes in this survey. When we asked elementary families <coughs> on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very optimistic, do, how do they feel about bringing all students back every day? You see I drew a line there to sort of show where the higher level of optimism would be. 86.7% um, expressed a higher level of optimism, with 57% of all respondents rating their optimism at a 9 or a 10. 27% of remote families have already stated that they intend to have their children return to school, too. <coughs> We asked elementary families what their level of concern was in regards to transitioning back to school on March 29th. 83% of families showed slight or no concern with this transition, with the remaining 17% expressing concern or great concern. And I'll get into what those concerns were at the end when we get to the commentary. <clears throat> when asked how concerned they were about their child's social and emotional well-being, families uh, showed greater concern, with 40% expressing concern or great concern. Now when we asked our secondary families the same question on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about bringing all students back every day? 
74.5% expressed a higher level of optimism, with 51% of all respondents rating their optimism at a 9 or a 10. <coughs> I was curious how this would compare if I broke it down by middle school and high school, just to see in terms of the family responses. Um, so I did that. And as you can see from this graph, <coughs> There was a very comparable rating among middle and high school families with 77.5% of our middle school families showing a higher level of optimism and 73.4% of our high school fa families showing a higher level of optimism. We also asked secondary families what their level of concern was in regard to transitioning back full time. 70.5% of families showed slight or no concern with this transition while the remaining 29.5% expressed concern or great concern. <clears throat> we also asked how concerned they were about their child's social and emotional well-being. Secondary families demonstrated even greater concern with 52.4% expressing concern or great concern. <clears throat> so in terms of the themes, again, there were a lot of comments that were made, but there were definitely themes that, that rose to the top. Uh, Three-foot distancing was a concern of, of many families. Comments uh, were more positive than negative, particularly at the elementary level. Many comments did show confidence, though, that the Plymouth Public Schools will continue to provide a safe environment. There were concerns expressed about students who have been full remote returning on a different level. How would they enter into this environment? Uh, concern about the increased amount of mask wearing Will students be able to tolerate this, as well as teachers being able to monitor mask wearing with more students to manage? There were safety concerns with at-risk family members at home. Uh, questions as how we will increase the number of kids and how that will impact lunch when masks are off. And also worried about quarantining with three-foot distancing in classrooms, which we can talk about, uh, we'll talk about later. Um, <coughs> Concerns about their children adjusting to a new schedule, a, a new sleep schedule, et cetera, and more kids in the classroom, more distractions, more chatter. So concerns about adjusting new schedules for that regard. Um, and there was not concern, over concern about transmission, but concern that their child has fallen behind. Lots of comments about children falling behind uh, from, the family, from the family comments. Continuing with that, um, mental health concerns, what steps are we taking to make sure that students feel emotionally comfortable with this shift to less spacing, which is something that I think regardless of the age that we're talking about, we need to make sure that we're doing that and we, will, we are working with administration and work, we will obviously work with our counselors to do that and we'll be providing an opportunity actually in the coming uh, very soon for our elementary families, which I'll talk about later. Um, families were concerned about um, hoping that we would limit the amount of work and homework as they transition back full time. Lots of homework concerns, the volume and the frequency of work and concern about that upon a full return. Um, now that we're going back, is th there's a need to communicate. And this was a lot of elementary comments, uh, particularly. Communicate the many, many logistics to families, which we will obviously will be doing. I talked about that last week, I believe. Um, that we need to be aware of the fact that this is yet another big transition for our students and make sure that communication is strong to everyone. Um, there's concerns that if the number of cases rise and, and, and we return five days a week, uh, stating that you know, a five-day return to school should occur if it can, be, can, safely, it can safely be continued through the, the remainder of the semester. And if kids return only to be pulled out again, it would be even more disruption to, their, to them emotionally and to their families. Uh, and concern that they could possibly be more kids that need to quarantine with no access to online learning if they are quarantined and how that would affect their learning if they're at home and they're under quarantine. Concerns about crowded hallways, concerns about transporta transportation, specifically car lines and with, with increased traffic at our schools. And uh, lastly, concerns about the accuracy of contact tracing and students who don't follow guidelines and protocols and, and making sure that we're on top of, of all that. So those were the collective concerns of our families. 
Now, when we look at our staff survey, we had 692 of our staff that participated. We asked our staff to respond to similar questions. Um, this is the breakdown of participation by level. So the survey questions were broken down by elementary and secondary. Uh, I've also did further analysis on some of the questions to look at breaking up the secondary level, and I'll get into that later in the presentation. But you can see that elementary uh, were the most responsive, followed by high school and then middle school. So when we asked our elementary staff on a scale of 1 to 10 how optimistic they were, 68.2% uh, expressed a higher level of optimism, with about 24% of all those respondents rating their optimism at a 9 or 10. So we had a, a good percentage that were highly optimistic and 68.2% that showed a higher level of optimism. Okay. We also asked elementary uh, what their level of concern was in regards to transitioning back to full person learning March 29th. Approximately 54% of staff showed slight or no concern with their transi transition, while the remaining 46% express concern of great concern and again we'll get into that later as well when our elementary staff were asked how concerned they were about their own social emotional well-being staff demonstrated 36.7 percent expressing concern or great concern now when we asked um, our secondary staff on a scale of one to ten their level of optimism 59.8% expressed a higher level of optimism. Again, though, with nearly 24%, 23.8, of all respondents rating their optimism at a 9 or 10. But you can definitely see a change in the level of optimism here in comparison to the families and the elementary. Right? So as I said before, though, I wanted to break that down even further. So I did. Um, I was curious how this would compare if I broke it down uh, by middle school and high school. 70.4% of our middle school staff expressed a higher level of optimism. Again, we had about we had 24.5% rating at 9 or 10. It's hard to see on that screen, but you can see it's in the bottom corner. 53.4% uh, of our high school staff expressed a higher level of optimism. But of all of the high school respondents, 23.5% expressed uh, either a level of 9 or 10. We also asked secondary staff what their level of concern was in regards to transitioning back to uh, full person learning. Again, similar to the elementary staff, approximately 54% of staff showed slight or no concern with this transition, while the remaining 46% expressed concern or, or great concern. When the secondary staff were asked how concerned they were about their own social and emotional well being, staff demonstrated 30.7%. Showing uh, concern or great concern. So, themes uh, among our staff. There's definitely a level of, um, first, I want to say there's definitely a level of optimism that was expressed by both elementary and secondary responses. Teachers expressed that they were happy to teach in one modality uh, and not be balancing two cohorts and a remote environment. That clearly came out in, in many comments. Teachers expressed pleasure with increased face-to-face -face instruction and also said that it would be easier to, and more manageable to administer some important special education services. So we saw that in many responses as well. Elementary staff also expressed satisfaction in the fact that their families and students were looking forward to returning. Many secondary staff also expressed that they were happy to have students back full-time with vaccination appointments being made at a greater rate than two weeks ago. Uh, many are also happy that they've been able to acquire a vaccination appointment. So related to that, I just want to say that, you know, we've been trying to work with Brewster Ambulance. We're still waiting for that. Uh, we had 900 people that responded to our initial survey regarding uh, vaccination through Brewster. Uh, I sent out a follow-up email yesterday to, to those 900 individuals just to see where they were in terms of vaccina vaccinations. Uh, as of this afternoon, 613 have already filled out that responded to my email, <coughs> and 75% of those have already either received a vaccine or have a scheduled vaccine. So that's very encouraging, and we'll continue to do that. And there's other opportunities that are arising, but I wanted to point that out. Um, some expressed concerns with vaccinations for everyone before returning, though. 
There was also a feeling by some that returning now was almost like starting over again at the end of the year. Some staff expressed concerns about shared supplies and having the necessary resources. Teachers expressed concerns with the possibility of transitioning right before a vacation, stating it would be stressful for students and learning time would be lost if we started before vacation. Staff were nervous about three, four distancing, concerned that we would not be following CDC guidelines. Teachers also are concerned about the amount of students that would have to quarantine and the quarantine would cause staffing issues potentially. Especially concerned for teachers uh, that have larger class sizes and the ability for students to follow the guidelines. Some teachers highlighted how small hybrid classes have allowed them to personalize learning more and were concerned that they will not be able to provide the same small group individualized instruction uh, that the hybrid model allows them to do. There was also concern about behaviors and students adjusting to being with a larger group of, uh, of students. Secondary staff said that they are concerned about the social emotional well-being of their students, saying that many students are concerned about their family's health uh, as well as their own and don't want to go get their loved ones sick. Staff said that hallways would be crowded and there's nowhere to take large uh, classes for indoor mass breaks. Staff also expressed concerns with being able to keep the larger number of students at the secondary level distance. So again, those are the, those are the themes that came at the secondary staff level and the staff level, excuse me, the staff level in general. Uh, now, in, I've also administered, we've also administered a survey to our high school students. So the next six slides that I'll share with you are gonna highlight what we learned from our students, okay? So in terms of participation, we had 1,068 of our 2,340 students actually take the survey. That's a 46% completion rate. This also included our Harbor, Harbor Academy, so North, South, Harbor Academy. Uh, there was uh, very comparable participation by grade level, as you can see, uh, with our juniors, uh, is it our juniors? Yeah, our junior class uh, leading the way with 27.7%. So we're gonna get into the results here. Now, in, when you look at the, the student's response to um, the, the optimism scale, approximately 46% of high schoolers were more optimistic about returning to school every day with 54% less optimistic. As you can see, there's great variance and divergence among our students' respondents. The strong opinions on both ends and varied opinions in between. So we've got varied opinions here from our high school students. We also asked our high schoolers what their level of concern was regarding returning to full in-person learning. 55, excuse me, 56.6% showed slight or no concern with the transition, while the remaining 43.4 expressed concern or great concern. This was very comparable to the teacher responses to, this, to the same question. We asked students how concerned they were about their own social emotional well-being. 35.4% express concern or great concern. Okay, so in terms of themes from students, first, I, I wanna say that overall, our students that participated in this survey did so with, with great thought. They took this opportunity very seriously. Um, one thing that is very apparent after conducting this survey is that our students are truly split in their opinions. They're truly split. Uh, regardless of where students fell on their, their opinions of returning to school, though, there were some common themes related to the amount of work that's being asked of them. Students were either concerned about this becoming more substantial if they returned full-time, concerned that teachers would try to make up for lost time, or they felt that the only way to balance the amount of work that's being asked of them was to return full-time on a regular basis. So they had same, similar concerns, but had different opinions about how that should be addressed. Okay, there was a lot of reference to missing the social connections with their peers. Many felt that going to school full time would help them to see their friends, but many also felt that the climate of school wouldn't uh, change much because even if they go back full time, they're missing the activities and the events uh, and that haven't been possible all school year. And I think we've heard that, but you know, we, we're aware of that. It's not, school is not the same this year because of all the restrictions. So that, that certainly came out in, in many of the comments from the students.
Um, as I said on the last slide, academic wor workload was a very common concern of students. Having conversations with administration last week about this concern, uh, they do believe that full-time would help to address this issue easier than remaining hybrid. Um, students dislike remote Mondays. This came across, um, it was a very common response, uh, something that we've heard you know, quite often from both students and staff during the year. Uh, students miss their friends. They miss their social element of high school, which makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Students wanting to return reference their academic struggles with the hybrid model. Many felt coming back would make this transition in September easier. Students mentioned their emotional strugg struggles not being in school full time. But we also heard from students that stated that returning to school would trigger them emotionally, specifically their concerns and anxiety over that transition. So again, we had two different similar concerns, but a, a different, uh, you know, a, a different response or opinion about how that would, uh, that concern would um, come to the top. Students opposed to returning saw this as another change. They expressed that they were now in a rhythm and didn't want to change the status quo. Seniors were less optimistic about returning to school, questioning the point of their return at this time of the year. Many students were worried about possibly having to quarantine due to the three foot distancing. There was also concern about getting COVID and passing it along to family members. So these were some, these were the, the real large emerging themes that they, they came um, from the student responses. Uh, you may recall, I just, I know that you've had this in front of you and you've had this before. So you may recall the charts that I'm presenting right now uh, on the following two slides. Dr. White, Dr. Bettinas, and Ms. Uh, Karen Vanette presented our mid our mid year academic progress at the secondary level last week's school committee meeting uh, at the middle school we've seen a considerable increase in failing grades in the first semester in comparison to trends over the past five years and additionally um, students receiving A's receiving A's has dropped uh, at the high school in our first semester we have seen both an increase in failing grades as well as an increase in A's suggesting that while some students are faring well in this hybrid model, many others aren't, okay? Uh, the next slide was shared last week. Um, also concerning uh, to me and to, to many of us is the discrepancy of performance that we're seeing among certain students. So our econo economically disadvantaged students have demonstrated a considerable decline in overall academic performance in comparison to the aggregate aggregate, excuse me, of our students, with middle school students failing classes at more than twice the rate of last year. And we're also seeing a similar, de similar decline in grades in the high school. Again, this is first semester though, okay? So to try to summarize all of this, because it's a lot of information, um, health metrics have improved across the Commonwealth in Plymouth, which we're glad to see. Research conducted by inf infectious disease experts, public health professionals, support three foot distancing and I've shared some of that. Um, I also wanna point out that um, the Massachusetts study is being reviewed by the CDC and you may have seen this, but the three foot distancing role, Dr. Fauci and the CDC is actually looking at that um, and, 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 that, and what that may do to uh, quarantine regulations uh, for, for school districts. Um, DESE has set dates for mandatory return, as I mentioned, for K to eight students and instructed districts to prepare all students for a full return. Uh, we are well prepared in terms of our health and safety logistics and our protocols. Um, families are largely in support, as you see from the data I've shared, of the students returning to school full time. Elementary parents are very optimistic about the full return to school March 29th. <clears throat> While K to five staff expressed a good deal of optimism, they do have concerns about the transition to full time, both for their students as well as their own well being. And while secondary parents are very optimistic about the return to school, teachers and students seem to have greater concern. So we have a difference of, of opinion and concerns from families in comparison to our teachers and our students at the high school level, particularly. Under the current DESE guidelines, students would need to quarantine at a greater rate should positive cases arise. And again, um, I'm hopeful that this will have some change 
um, and they've taken that Massachusetts study into consideration. Students' academic performance has been negatively affected, as we know. Uh, while our high school students have either performed worse or better in their classes, students in the middle school have shown a decline in grades overall, and our economically disadvantaged students, as I said, have demonstrated considerable decline overall, which is concerning to us. <laughs> so given everything that I have just said, um, knowing what is and what is not in our control, I am proposing that we consider a return date of April 12th for 7th to 12th graders. Uh, this is the start of term four, so it's, 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 a it's the very beginning of term four. Um, this provides us uh, time to address logistics, survey our families regarding their, intention, their absolute intentions, and reschedule students whose families prefer a remote option. People in the community need to know that we, it's not something that we can do immediately. We need time to do that. That would give us the time. It allows us to make the most informed decisions using a, any additional guidance that comes that should be released and make sure that we're communicating that out before secondary students would return. I think it continues to demonstrate a commitment to the conditions outlined in February 6th when we met um, about a month ago. Um, and our administration is working to develop a plan to support the social emotional needs of all students and staff. Um, you know, our elementary and, and whenever our secondary students uh, would return as well. Um, it's important to know, excuse me, I'm having a trouble with my screen here. Um, our buildings have adjust, addressed all logistics. Class sections can adequately space students in classrooms. If that's been confirmed by our, by our high schools and our middle schools. Many can be spaced even further than three feet. The greatest challenge to our return is the distribution of lunches. At the middle schools, additional space such as our large lecture halls and gymnasium would be used for lunches. All lunches would continue to be provided at at least six feet of distance. At the high schools, allocating space for over 1,000 students to eat socially distanced at six foot or greater on a daily basis is very challenging. After much thought and consideration and after listening to what other districts are also doing nearby, it is our recommendation that if we move in this direction at the high school, uh, that lunches be provided at the end of the day in a grab and go fashion at 1.30. So dismissing students 30 minutes early this would allow students to provide um, anyone interested in a free lunch. We have free breakfast and lunch every day um, without changing the high school course schedule. We would literally shift lunch to the end of the day. But people are concerned about students eating and, and, and how long that would be. So given the fact that our students start at 720, there's also an opportunity, obviously, to get breakfast in the morning. We would be able to use those large spaces for students that want breakfast. And we also have what's called K-Block or advisory which is done in small groups. Students are spread out, which happens at 10.13, so you know, less than three hours midday, midpoint in the day, another opportunity for students to eat. So they don't have to wait until 1.30 to eat, so they could still eat socially distanced then as well. So I, I realize that I presented a lot of information, um, but I, we need the community to know, our students, our staff, our families to know, and, and everyone here to know that a, a considerable amount of time and thought has been put into this recommendation. We certainly do not make it, I certainly do not make it lightly. Um, there is no perfect solution. I think that's really important for the public to know, for our kids to know, our families to know. There is no perfect answer to this. Um, as you've seen from our surveys, there are considerable differences in opinions and concerns. Um, given the message that we've heard from the commissioner and how he's instructed us to prepare everyone for a full return, I feel that it would be in our best interest to return all secondary students at the start of the fourth term so that we can better support our students that are demonstrating great challenges with our current hybrid model. And that is the largest, re that, that's, that's my reason for that recommendation. So I'm going to um, end my screen share there. And I'm, I know I've spoken for a, a long time. I'm happy mm -hmm. to answer any questions that you may have too. All right, does anybody have any questions? I'm looking this, you can go I haven't first. gone this way yet. Ms. Badger? 
I have a variety of questions, but I'll ask one to start with, and so I don't take up everyone's questions. I'm sure we have many of the same. Um, I know listening to the students here and, and their emails and everything that we've received from parents and all over, all over the board, just like your survey. Um, and my question goes to, um, with the being closer in classrooms and the six feet distance still allowing having students quarantine at that six foot, which, you know, maybe that'll change. Um, but are there any things in place, and I tried to read on the AP website, in place for students that say, unfortunately, they have a quarantine right around when their AP exam takes place. I just took a certification exam on Friday in my house, and I, and I was wondering if that's available. It is actually way more stressful than I thought it would be because you have to be constantly looking at the screen. You cannot look away. Your face must be. It's and trying to answer questions, and you're like, is my face in the screen? Am I good? Um, and so I'm just wondering if we have options for our students in that case with our AP and other exams that they have to take at the end of the year. So th through, the, th through the college board that you're, that you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, if they've made any kind of um, considerations for quarantine measures for our students. I'm sure that given the fact that there are districts that have been in remote, that there's, I know that they were using them all last year. Um, yeah. I saw them myself. Um, we certainly would explore that. I think the challenge we have here is not, well, first of all, is coming up with a solution that's gonna work for all students that are in all classes, not just our AP students, but students that are in our, of course. some of our other classes, and keeping them on track for their courses when they quarantine. Quarantining is my biggest concern. Yes. I'm very optimistic, I'm happy to see that the CDC and Fauci are looking at the Massachusetts study. I think it gives them, you know, again, a lot of data to look at um, and suggest that it's been, you know that this can take place and that our quarantine measures maybe are too restrictive our own data has demonstrated that we've had students that have been close contacts in school um, due to in school exposure 93 since the start of the year none of them none of those cases resulted in a, in a positive case during you know two or three weeks it may have they may have developed it a month later from a different situation but I think our own internal evidence supports the Massachusetts case and what the CDC is saying. But getting back to your question, Ms. Badger, um, the quarantine piece is a concern of mine. Having students be disrupted, um, there are districts that have been remoting students in. Mm -hmm. That's a matter of um, um, working conditions, okay. which would need to be agreed upon by the, so the association. Um, we're not there yet on that. That's what I can say about that. Okay. Um, so it really is going to be, and I, I, this question was posed to me by this teachers because I did share this presentation with our faculty at 345. Um, it is, it's up to the teacher to, to, to help the students stay on track when they're out. Um, certainly it could be you know, using College Board materials for AP students, but any other measure that we have. Uh, I think it's a lot of work for a teacher Mm -hmm. If you have eight students that are out due to a quarantine, yeah. uh, I personally think it's less work to remote kids in. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a subject to, uh, to, to uh, um, working conditions that we would have to work out with the association. But we will, do, we will, regardless of what model we're in, we will work with you know, teachers in our administration to f and, and counselors to figure out what we would do in those situations to keep kids going. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure that obviously with any level of our students seeking any exams wherever they are that they're you know staying up but for a group of students who have worked really hard to post possibly get college right. credit and then to be in the middle of that yeah. and not be able to do it i feel like is a huge i, I don't know yeah, they, they do have makeup days but we wouldn't want them to have to do that yeah uh, right I, I have one at home myself yeah right yeah. done <laughs> yeah. Dr. Sorensen, did you have a question? Yes, I have, uh, I have two areas. First, I want to say something about the studies that you quoted, and then I want to speak more specifically to the return of our students on April the 12th. Now, Dr. Vandenberg's study was well done. It's cited by CDC. You referenced it really well tonight. It actually has the same findings of the Ohio study that I mentioned here at our previous meeting. Mm -hmm. Dr. Campbell, the one thing you didn't mention and I want to bring it up because I believe it's important. Our students spoke about it tonight. We see it in the surveys. Both studies said that they did find a correlation between community positivity rate and school positivity rate. 
That was the only positive correlation reported in both studies. So as long as the town of Plymouth continues to drop down, our concern of a positivity rate based on these findings should also continue to drop down, which would then mean that our quarantining period would be l l less students would be affected. So I feel positive about that particular part of the science. I do want to say that on April 12th, uh, no, 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 I do want to say that our previous meeting, Dr. Campbell, you listed, and I'm going to read off half a dozen of them, furniture storage, meals, car lines, student parking, review of class size, schedule of remote student, use of the gym, lunch to go, and staggered arrivals as areas that we need to focus on yes. and have, I believe, ready to go and in place before April 12th. Correct. Will we have those things yes. set up? Yes. The storage oh. has already been resolved. We have 13 storage units. The, the um, cafeterias have been cleared already at the elementary level. There's no storage needs at the high schools. Uh, regarding lunch, my recommend, our recommendation, you can see for the high school, is different. Um, furniture has been ordered where we needed it. Um, additional desks have been ordered if necessary. Uh, I would not make that recommendation if I felt we wouldn't make it by that deadline. Absolutely. Uh, and the ones you didn't mention, uh, Sorry. Ske scheduling remote students. Now, you, you yes. mentioned it in your report, but that's yep. going to be a, a bit of a sticky wicket. Yes? Right. So we're not seeing, so right now we've made a recommendation. You, you, there was a vote for the elementary, which March 29th. So once that took place, we've been reaching out to families. We're not seeing families really going out as much, uh, it, it, but we have some coming in. But those are things that we do. Now, we would do that. Um, today is March 15th. So that's almost a month. April 12th is almost a month from that deadline, which would clearly whatever the recommendation or the vote would be, whether it's to support this or to change it or whatever it is, should we have a date, we would immediately work with our administration, our guidance counselors, we'd be communicating to all families uh, to make a, to, uh, make it a decision regarding um, getting classes set up. You may recall in the summer, we had far less time to do that when we got guidance from the state. We received guidance in terms of the remote options August fourth, I believe, and we set that up in a more expedient fashion. So I feel confident with uh, this, the percentage of students that we were dealing with that we could handle that as well. Uh, two, two outstanding, I well, three outstanding items, the use of the gym, the car lines, yep. and the sections. Yes, sections have been resolved, so the principals have looked at that. There's no issues with sections. They did move a couple of classrooms. Uh, to accommodate that, so that's uh, that's all they needed to do. Again, this is at the high school, middle school is not an issue. The use of the gymnasium um, would be for lunches at one of our middle schools, maybe the second. Where I know that we're using the lecture hall. We'd be using the lecture hall at South Middle School for some overflow, but lunches are not an issue at the middle school with the, that additional space, and the high school would be an issue unless we did that... Um, an adjustment to the schedule that we mentioned this evening. I'm, I'm fairly confident that you have all of these areas covered. I appreciate that. One last point, if I may. Uh, the students who snack during K block, they bringing that from home? They, they certainly can bring snacks from home, but we have, the food service has had a lot of food available. We have so much food available. Um, as you know, that free breakfast and lunch has been provided since last year. It's extending all the way through the summer. So we feel very confident that if someone does not have food, uh, that we would make it available. We have conversations with our nurses too about students with low blood sugar. We, we feel very confident that we, if a student didn't have food, we would have food to provide. To so them. the logistics for getting the food to those students in their classrooms during K block, we can work that out? We could work that. If someone didn't have something and they needed that with the time frame that they have, we absolutely could do that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Morgan? Yeah, I just like to, uh, excuse me. I just like to comment. I really appreciate your efforts here with surveying all different groups, different grade levels, you know, to get the feedback. That's, you know, we asked for that, so that's terrific. And what I'm seeing here is overwhelming support to go back, except for students that are 50 50. So there's really a strong um, feeling about bringing the kids back um, to school. And, um, and then you're also following the science. I know back in March or April of last year, we shut everything down because we were told to follow the science. Now the science is pointing towards bringing the kids back. So we need to follow the science, just not when it's convenient, but we need to follow it. So I really appreciate your efforts here. And 
the commissioner sounds like she's going to mandate bring the kids, the students back at some point this year, full time for the end of the year. He, he did. He did say that prepare all students for a full return. He, he explicitly said that on the 10th. So I think we take a leadership role and bring them back or recommend to bring them back at the beginning of the term. I think that's a good starting point. It's probably maybe a week or two earlier than what sounds like the commissioner might go with, but it's going to it sound like it's inevitable anyways. And with all your efforts preparing the schools, preparing this, um, the lunches and the lines and all that, you know, I really think I really agree with your recommendation to bring them back on the 12th. Um, I, I'll get to you in just a second, but I know my, my question directly relates to his. The one thing that concerns me is this is a week before April vacation. And they're saying right now spring break for colleges is going on right now. I know the class I'm taking at Harvard is on spring break and my daughter's on spring break and they're predicting that this spring break is going to be bad and it's going to have a huge surge. And we're planning on bringing the kids back the week before the April vacation. I'm just, that's a, a concern to me. I mean, I agree with what, what Mr. Morgan's saying, but it almost sounds like it's a week too early for me, but I don't, I mean, I'm gonna wait and hear the whole discussion before yeah. I make up my decision, but I, okay. that really makes me nervous. I, all over the news today, all they kept talking about was how bad the spring break this week is gonna be. And I would really like for to college, see for what college happens after college. this week. College. For college, yeah, right. but still, it doesn't matter. People are traveling. People are going to be traveling that week as well. So that just that yep. makes me a little bit. Again, I just want to be clear. My recommendation was based on where we are in terms of our health metrics, as well as my concerns for the students and their act, what, what we're dealing with in terms of academics. There, some people had concerns about having a week before that it would be disruption to learning. I, I almost had the opposite opinion of that, meaning that. If students are, are worrying about that all April break, now that, that the week that they return may be disrupted versus having an opportunity to try to work with them and support them the week and then they, they're off. But I understand your concerns regarding. I'm just thinking uh, they go the back, concerns. they let their guard down, they think everything's normal, then they have a week off and they do what we've seen them do on the other breaks sure. in the high school level. And you know, I, that just, that's my only concern because they'll, I, I know that we have the COVID test that we can give them again to come back yes, with. Yes, we, we, we could, we, thank you for bringing that up because I did not mention that, but we absolutely could surveillance test students um, the week that they return. Mm -hmm. um, we could, we could do that with all students and we could do that after, we could, we could do that the week before, we could do that the week before they come to um, like the week of the fifth. For example, and we could we could provide optional surveillance testing to all students before they come in, closer contact. Yeah. We could do that again uh, prior to them returning from April break, like we did for February vacation. Um, there's definitely options. Um, we certainly um, we are, I'm not the f we, we have other districts that are have been going back sooner, um, and we do have some that are going back after the April break. Mm -hmm. okay. I just don't want I them just, to have that Can I just say something to your security. point? Since the studies we're relying upon found a correlation between community positivity rate and school positivity rate, I would say personally, if the community positivity rate goes back up into the red, Good. all bets are off. Right. right. Um, I know. Do, I was just going to add to that. Okay. Let me get to Mrs. Burgess. Yep. All, I, all I wanted to do is we've said uh, when the, um, the uh, high school, uh, the uh, secondary schools will go back. But we haven't repeated again when the elementary schools we had set the date. March 29th. March you 29th. voted on that? Voted yes. On that, that was meeting. in there. That's yeah. March that was 29th. voted on last meeting. We already voted on that. Yeah. What? We that. voted on that the last meeting. I, kn I know we did. I'm talking about for the public. So, oh, that, yes. so that they hear. We're only talking about middle and high, high school, really. Yeah. You're not talking about the elementary well, for a decision. Decision. Yeah. Huh? Yes, we, we, you're right. We did, for the public's sake, we did agree um, that was voted here to support a March 29th return for elementary students. Yep. All right, Ms. Badger, and then I don't, I don't see, and then after Ms. Badger, we'll get to Mrs. Hayes. Yeah, right, I was just going to say, following on your line of logic that you both are sharing, and I am not 100% into the sending high school students back at this, uh, uh, to me, I just, hearing what they they said and their feelings and some of the things I think about and yes follow the science but 
the science is changing, so what do we know what to follow? Um, but also, if we're going to follow this logic, my thought is, you know, if we're going to have the high school students come back, why the week right after a vacation? I already know two or three families who are going to an island. They're going someplace warm. Wouldn't it make sense to start May 3rd? You know, you're, you've given them that one week afterwards so we can get whatever germs out of the system and we can do tests and we can make sure the kids are good. And then May 3rd might give us a better chance of being uh, surviving. All right, we have um, Ms. Haywood and I believe Alexandra has a question too. Ms. Haywood? I'll let Alex go, her hand was up before All right. mine. Al Alexandra, do you wanna ask your question? Um, yeah, I have two things. So I also know a lot of students that are going away over April vacation, especially to look at colleges, since it's a lot of seniors last opportunity and juniors are getting ready to apply next year too. Um, and then I do have a question about AP classes. So if a student were to go remote and not just like quarantining, but like actually choose to go remote and go through the system of like the Massachusetts education, um, do you know if AP classes would still be offered through that? And if we'd still be able to take like our AP exams? Good question, Alex. First of all, you can always take your AP exam. We have students that take the AP exam even, we've had students take the AP exam that haven't even taken the class before. So that is something that you actually have available to you. Uh, in terms of the Massachusetts approved programs, uh, they are closed to all districts now. So they're not an option anymore. The only options are edgenuity, and I have to look at the courses that are provided there. But if those courses are provided there, we could certainly provide that as an option, but I'm, I, I, we would have to look at that specifically. Um, but um, in terms of the, the, um, the TECA Academy, that's not an option, but Edgenuity may have something. And we certainly would work with any student to try to, prov to provide the resources to make sure that they um, were getting what they needed, but it, it will be more challenging, uh, no question. Thank you. Ms. Haywood, did you have a question too? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, this one, I guess a couple of questions. Um, I would just like if uh, the waiver process could be explained at the state level. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so the waiver process, and this is directly from the commissioner, the waiver process is if you cannot physically fit your students at three feet, you can submit a waiver, essentially. And once that waiver is submitted, they will send a team out to your district as a consult to see if they have recommendations on how to fit your school within three feet. So that waiver process is gonna be very, um, uh, very limited in terms of how many people are granted waivers. And, and certainly, um, in my opinion, after listening to the commissioner and what that process would be, Plymouth certainly would not qualify uh, based on uh, the conditions and in, in the, in the, our buildings being able to fit our students. Okay, um, also in terms of like whether the biomed and or tech programs, if, if um, families choose to do remote, will they have an ability to be in these programs or are they totally separated? Um, yeah, again, good question. Um, the unfortunate uh, condition about this is we're, we're, to provide an additional remote option at this point, point in the school year would be very, very challenging. Uh, we would need additional staff to staff that unless we had teachers that were remoting students in to those particular courses. And again, as I said, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's subject to working conditions, uh, which would have to be agreed upon by the association. So it makes it very difficult without having um, some kind of an agreement with the union to remote students in to those courses. We can't replicate the biomed. Um, we can't replicate the, the tech courses, CCTE courses uh, in a remote fashion without teachers. So it's either having additional teachers to provide that option or having students remote into those courses. And again, that's something that would be uh, a change in working conditions that we would have to have an agreement from our association to do. So, so if they'd started this, um, I, it, we're in a hybrid model, 
and then chose to do remote because they didn't want to do the full five or the full um, in person, then they would lose on that in this late date. Yes, in that, would be, it, it would be a, that would be a major impact. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think also too, like in terms, the concern was brought up by one of the students um, regarding contact tracing. Um, would those efforts still continue? Oh, absolutely. I, I want to, I just want to take a moment to commend our nurses and our teachers for the contact tracing and our administrators for the contact tracing that they've doing, they're doing. Certainly students would have assigned seats. Um, and with those assigned seats, we can do contact tracing in terms of confirmed cases in school. Um, everything would be assigned. Our buses now are, are, are assigned once we, once we utilize them um, in a larger capacity. So knowing exactly where students are supposed to be sitting at all times, um, we would, the, the contact tracing would be um, busier if we have uh, more cases, but um, absolutely, the contact tracing is not going to um, stop this year at all in terms of the efforts. Um, do we understand the delay um, as to why the B Board of Education is not speaking on the return of high school students? No, I, I have no idea. I'm, I, 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 that goes, I'm, I've been trying to figure that out myself for the longest since, since the announcement was made. Uh, the mm -hmm. commissioner really did not speak to his reason why. Uh, he just said that it we would find out in April and he'd give us two weeks notice, but he never mentioned why and wouldn't answer that particular question. So I'm not sure what's going on in that regard. Okay. Um, and then just my last, this is a statement like kind of mixed with a question. Um, Dr. Sorensen had mentioned, you know, um, in terms of like the community, um, the school transmission, um, you know, um, it has a correlation with the community transmission and, and that there would, you know, all bets would be off. But watching the hearing, um, after this decision is made, I can't imagine that you would be able to go back and, and make a different decision. Um, it was interesting hearing even one of the physicians state that that she didn't even think that school testing needed to be done um, because she didn't believe that there was any transmission um, within the schools. I just, I think given the fact that in February we had made a decision um, regarding April 26th, um, we stated the issue of vaccinations. We did mention weather, which is, you know, this is New England um, and, um, you, we haven't necessarily like honored all of those like stipulations that we placed. So I think it's, um, I don't know, just given, um, I don't see why, I understand April 12th is the beginning um, of a, um, of the like a quarter or whichever, but I'm trying to understand the rush specifically with high school students. If we haven't gotten, um, you know, any of that information from the Board of Education. Um, we had Mr. Morgan raised his hand first and then Mr. Pisano. Well, oh, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, you haven't spoken yet, so go me. ahead. <laughs> I'm trying to be fair here. One of the things I want to dig into Dr. Campbell was the idea of students being able to remote in. You know, I mean, whether, no matter what budget you're on, whether Conservatively, had probably 130 kids quarantined. Progressive was now pretty good, like 192. That's simple math. Mm -hmm. And two weeks ago or three weeks ago, you said it. You said that it worked something out with the, the teachers. You said the same thing today. That's a giant gap that you're still saying has to be worked out. And you're asking us to make a decision today with something that's a giant gap that isn't worked out yet. How, I mean, cool. they just made me resentful. <laughs> What's the, yes. and I, I'm not, what's the timeline for getting that worked out? I, that's I, a huge gap for me. I, regardless of uh, when this committee agrees to uh, return students, at this point, 
I'm not very optimistic that we will get an agreement to that, which would, would be a concern if it was May 3rd or April 12th. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that honesty. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I just, we've had, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's, like I said, been, I mean, that is my biggest concern. Yeah, it's not like we're talking like the one from 10 kids and 18 adults and 20. This is, we're just talking across the country. And that's, that's, that's a big problem for me. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, I, I don't, and, but I'm, I'm really only concerned with the high schools at this point. If I look at you know, the middle schools, all the, the data, the, the prep, the surveys, both family, staff, you know, it's pretty, you know, pretty clear. Um, yeah. not, notwithstanding the Duffy requirement anyway, so really this really isn't even a, a decision for us to make at this point other than what date we choose. Mm -hmm. um, but with the high schools, to me that, between the students and the staff, there's no way you can look at that data and say there's overwhelming support to go back. And I don't understand what, what was the point of surveying high school students if we're not gonna even take into consideration. And I'm not saying I'm some, a hard no here, but to just look at this data today and be asked to make a decision on the 12th doesn't seem reasonable to me. We, 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 did, the, we did these surveys for a reason. We should consider them and take time to make this decision. Y yes, absolutely. Yes, and you're right that we had, um, there clearly was um, more concern from our teachers and students at the high school level than, than the families at the high school level. Yeah. I'm still getting comments that people are, aren't, aren't able to hear us at home, so I don't know if we just need to be careful more, talk to our mics, or if there's a sound issue. Mm -hmm. Well, they, I asked if it was better when you did this, and they said no. So I don't know. Um, Just came here. Mr. Morgan? Thank you. Um, Dr. Campbell, uh, with the, I know there was a spike after the Christmas vacation, particularly to, due to one event. Yep. Um, did we see a significant spike during, after the February vacation? No. Um, so my only comment is I, I thought that was the case. Also, you know, if, if, if families and students feel comfortable to go on island vacations and go to Florida, they should feel comfortable going to our schools where we have all these protocols in place. And, you know, that's, that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Dr. Swanson? Just to, uh, in, 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 in due reference to uh, Ms. Haywood's comments, we set out in early February four criteria for coming back to school, transportation, positivity rate, vaccines, and the opportunity for outdoor classrooms. I believe those four things have been, are being met. Transportation was the biggest, positivity rate was second, and those things are falling into place for this decision. Uh, secondly, uh, Mr. Paisano, I want to make a comment about my concern about surveying students because it is very hard to tell when you survey students what the variables are that they're, they're responding to. They may not only be responding to their health, they could be responding to their workload or their homework or their, or their social interactions. So it's a gr I, I agree with your point. Surveying adolescents doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you never know what they're thinking. Mrs. I want, all I wanted to say is, I mean, the, the state really has said we needed to do this. So what, can, what are we arguing about? We've done everything that's proper and right. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we have to work out the issues for those few who can't do it. I, I, we do have to do something about that. But, uh, but really, everybody has to go back, back to school and the state has taken away the programs that okay. they have, so it isn't gonna happen anything, any different anyway. Well, they haven't high school yet. That's, the pro that's part of the problem. They haven't said anything. They, they haven't come up with they're, what they're, they're gonna do. They're meeting the 26th of April but is they, their next But meeting. I think they yeah. said everybody was to be to school. Mm -hmm. that yes. It's just a matter of right, when. Right, right, and, and figuring yeah, out the only logistics. When. But I know the commissioner has the, the I, think, I believe the commissioner has the authority now to determine. Yeah, he doesn't need the boards. He's already granted the the board has already approved him. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The, the, the regulations and given him the authority yeah. to come up with the transition plan. 
and, and th th notice they ha he made the, the announcement after the last board okay, meeting so regarding his middle school. He did not present that to the board exactly. specifically. Yeah, I think it even said that local school boards don't even have the authority. If they say you're going back, you're going back. It, it's binding. Yeah. Yeah. It, whatever the commissioner says will be binding. Is uh, yep. Um, Ms. Badger? I just wanted to say, just for Dr. Sorensen's comment about the survey, and I understand what you're saying about adolescents and the different viewpoints, but I think you can say that about every human being on the planet. You don't know where they're coming from, where they are, where their worldview is, what they're going through when they answer a survey. I mean, surveys are great. We all use them for our studies and things that we've done, but there's no way knowing where anybody at any age is thinking or feeling when they're filling something out. To ask a question? Yes. When Dr. is the uh, last day of classes for seniors? Not their finals, but their last day of classes? May 28th. May 20 what? May 28th right. is the last day. Um, I, I had a question. I was really hoping to see the comments, and I know that you said there were thousands of them, and I still would like to read them. Um, I've had a lot of people ask us to make sure, you know, that you get a chance to read the comments, and I would like to still see them. I know there was no time before this vote to actually read the comments, but I think it would help us. I could extract them into an Excel sheet for you to look at. Um, that would be the only way that I'd be able to do that. Yeah, that's that's one thing that I was really looking for when I was going in here, Ms. Yep. Ms. Badger. I, could, I mean, these are the themes that, were, that came out of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I know, but I, I know that I would like to have read the individual comments. Ms. Badger? Sorry, it just left me. <laughs> yeah, that, that was gone. Sorry. Does anybody have any uh, anything else? Any other questions? I, Alex oh, Harris. Alex, I'm sorry, I see you. Sorry. Um, I just want to say to clarify about like students going to visit colleges and stuff. I wouldn't say it's specifically about them. I'd say that it's rather like the consequences that other kids are going to have to suffer because they went on vacation. Um, so the choice that they made to go away is going to affect a lot more people, especially with three feet distancing versus six. So, Okay, anybody else? Mr. Bizzano? Oh. Similar line as Alex is, you know, the, I can't imagine that the same folks that are comfortable going on exotic vacations now are the same 50% that are really concerned with going back to school. So yes, I understand that some people are pretty comfortable with that. That's not to say that those same people are the same people that are concerned. You're probably looking at the two populations there. You're looking at folks that are perfectly fine going back and ones that aren't. So, I mean, we, they said, um, it needs to be clear that we have a very split community here mm -hmm. and we need to, you know, think that through. Uh, Mr. Ms. Bridges. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, it's, it's tougher with the, with high school kids because they can make up their own mind. So I'm thinking if they go back to school, the week before vacation, maybe they'll see the benefit of what they've got <clears throat> and they'll be less willing to go on vacation. Well, I think the their vacations careful. are already planned yeah. at this point. My, yeah. my kids have not gone <laughs> for various other reasons, yeah. but I'm just saying, yeah. you know, they, they're pretty, they, they can make up their own minds. Ms. Badger? I'd like to move that we, um, our middle school go back on April 12th by the guidance that Dr. Campbell has shared with the administration. Okay, so we'll just talk about the middle school. Mr. Pisano? I will second. All right, any discussion on voting for the middle school to go back on the 12th? What is it? We're, we're gonna, we have a motion to vote on whether or not the middle school will go back on the 12th. Okay. So I think that's a good idea. Take it one at a time, mm -hmm. but yeah. any discussion no, on middle second. school? No, it's already been seconded. Yeah. We're at the discussion. I'm questioning if you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I thought Dr. You Campbell presented uh, both the middle school and the high school together on the same date. If we pass this motion and then don't pass a subsequent motion, are you concerned about that? So this is what I can say about that. I I have. I have the same. I have concerns, the same concerns that the students tonight have expressed, I have the same concerns that th that this survey respondents had um, for, on both ends. This is not an easy decision. I am concerned about quarantines. Um, 
I'm ho I'm hoping that, that the regulations change on that because I do believe we can keep our kids safe at three feet. The quarantines is my biggest concerns mm -hmm. at all levels. Um, it, it, that is a concern of mine. Um, my my the reason for my recommendation of the 12th was specifically related to the fact that our families showed much more optimism in this thinking of our our families you know our high school families and middle school families and our elementary families were very optimistic but our families expressed a great deal of optimism i looked at um you know everything that i presented in terms of the science but also how our students that aren't doing well in this model are doing acad ac their academic performance and I'm, my concern for those students at the middle school and high school that are not, have not done well academically um, in our current hybrid model in, in, in the information that I shared with you. Now, I do, I do feel that we will have students that have, I, I'm, it, doesn't take it, it does not take away from the fact that I'm concerned about the quarantines. It does not take away from the fact that I know that students are having um, difficulty with the idea of coming back and have concerns, um, but we're, they're very split. Our students are clearly very split, and I, think, I don't think that would change if we surveyed them again. Um, again, my concern about the high school is um, how, the students are, how the students are doing in terms of their, their, their academics. May I follow up yes. because I didn't get an answer to my question. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> if we were to, s if the middle school motion were to pass yes. and a subsequent motion were to fail, that is, a high school would wait longer to come back. You're presenting them, as, you're presenting them as one recommendation. Would there, be, can you see a difficulty in us passing one motion and not the other? Well, I think the difficulty is not knowing when the high school students would come back and whether or not we're going to be able to successfully support those students that are not doing well in the hybrid model. Mm -hmm. Could you say that again, please? Yeah, the please difficult, the difficulty would be um, not pass, the, I mean, the fact that you passed the middle school students, that, that, that's not a problem. Not, uh, not knowing when the high school students would return to a full model. Uh, my concern is, um, the students that are not doing well academically in the hybrid model. And I, my recommendation was to have them come back at the f beginning of the term in order to try to have a fresh start with them and to have more contact. I think what this pandemic has demonstrated to us is the power of the classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at our high schools, our students have one physical contact day Mm -hmm. with their teachers in the given week. For some of our students, they have done quite well in this model. They can manage their time, their executive functioning skills are strong, um, and emotionally they've been able to handle and I think they feel safer, and I can appreciate that. I really, really can appreciate that. Um, as, as I presented in, in the survey data, we have students that are concerned emotionally on both ends in both you know on both ends of the spectrum here in terms of their opinions um, whether or not to go back um, we do have students that aren't doing well in the hybrid model um, we have you know we have tried to bring in students that are high needs and we've increased that but at some point you saturate a classroom and if you don't have all you know if you you you, you can only go so far at six mm -hmm. feet when you have so many students that are not doing well academically, and if you want to bring more kids, that just if you're if you're, if if we were to just address the students that are not doing well and saying you're coming back in, we're creating a we're creating an instructional situation where our teachers couldn't do that, um, particularly at the high school level. But um, that's my biggest concern, Dr. Sorensen. Right, may I ask one more question? I'm mm, sorry. Sure. Can you say something? Uh, bring us up to date on vaccinations, please, for staff. Yes, thank you. So um, I, we had 900. So we did a survey after I found out about Brewster Ambulance, and the, the Brewster is still looking to, to get approved. I had a correspondence with them on Sunday. Have not gotten word on that yet. Um, 
that was quite some time ago when we had those conversations. So since then, we've had a, a lot of vaccination appointments open up. CVS, the federal partnership with pharmacies, has really opened the doors to vaccinations. So of the 900 people that showed initial interest of the vaccine through Brewster, I inquired again over the weekend with them uh, directly by email to 900 individuals. I, as of five o'clock this afternoon, I had 613 people get back to me. And of the 613 people, 75% of them have already either been vaccinated with one dose or have a scheduled appointment. So it's very optimistic there. Uh, I also sent out an op another opportunity this afternoon that I learned about from uh, Representative Lenatra for a local provider that has, t tends to have uh, additional doses available, excess doses and we've created a list for them to get vaccinated as well. So um, it's definitely trending in a very positive way, Dr. Sorensen. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I have a couple of questions, but now I'm confused if we should ask questions just about the middle school because that's what where the motion is. Because my questions are about the high school, so I'll keep those yeah, for afterwards. Sure. Sure. You can't hear? Yeah, I couldn't hear you. I Where said, I have a couple of questions that have come up, but it's more high school questions, and the motion on the table is about middle school, so I'm going to wait and ask my questions after we take the vote. Are there any more discussions on this vote? No? Okay, so the motion on the table is to bring back the middle school on April 12th, which originally we said we were going to do a tiered approach, and that would make it a true... Okay, so we'll go ahead, Dr. Sorensen? No. Ms. Badger? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. yes. Ms. Badger? I mean, Ms. Burgess? <laughs> yes. Mr. Pisano? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. And I vote yes. So the vote is passed to bring the middle school students back on the 12th. And do we want to? Grimes has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Grimes. It, um, six to one. It was six to one, Dr. Sorensen. No, I think Ms. Haywood was a no too, wasn't she? Oh, I'm she? sorry, Ms. Haywood, did you vote yes or no? I voted yes. Yes. Yeah, she voted yes. yes, but I heard it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now we can move on to the, the high school. Do we want to take a motion or do we want to discuss more first? I'll make a motion to bring back high school at the same date, April 12th, start of the term, based on administration's recommendation. And Ms. Mrs. Burgess seconds. Any discussion? I have some questions. Or Ms. Go no, ahead. You, you, you go have first. questions. I'll go last. statement. You go. Um, I I have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, somebody said the twelfth is a half a day. Yep. So is that going to be a difficult day to bring all the kids back? It won't be. A half I don't see why it would be any different. Okay. Um, and then the other question is um, for the tech kids, if you have a family that does not want to for whatever reason for health reasons come back they're going to technically miss about a month of their their tech program right and you had said earlier that there there's no sure. really way to do that in a full um, remote model correct but is there any way that they would be able to make up that time could they would they be just done like if you have a kid I that's Yep. gone three years of tech and they sure. missed that month are they done again i think um at the beginning of the year if there was a student or family that had concerns about their child's health we we tried to provide options then um i honestly there is just so there are only so many resources that we have available to us in order to replicate the program of studies at the high school for students who would elect now to go remote so whether it's april 12th may 3rd or any time before the end of the year for families that don't want their children in at three feet it is going to be extremely difficult to replicate what they're currently doing in their class there are just no resources we would need additional staff the reason why we did a remote academy at the elementary level is because it's much more manageable to do um, unless you're remoting students into the classroom. That, you know, it, it's very difficult to replicate that in a, in a vocation, vocational yeah, yeah, technical no, I, setting. I, I agree, but I'm wondering about makeup time. Like, say you have a junior, and they end up missing a month of, can they, 
somehow you're do double up, duty next year? Can they take something over the summer? Like without just so knowing that three the details, Miss Savory, I can't say I couldn't give a definite. I know that for students, for example, in um, uh, which program were we, was it? Allied Health that we're doing extra hours. Um, it was cosmetology. Cosmetology, you know. So for certain programs that ha needed additional contact hours, we've tried to get creative and provide additional opportunities. But without knowing the particular student, knowing the particular program, um, I certainly could not suggest or say that we could do anything definitively. We would need to work directly with that individual's family to look at what we're talking about um, and what that experience is. So uh, if the committee at some point are, is to elect to have students come back, we would work with those families through guidance and administration to to look at that. But I can't, I can't without knowing the details, I could not give a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other discussion, Dr. Spencer? I want to uh, take your very, your very philosophy and apply it to those students who are not doing well. Mm -hmm. Because just like you're saying that mm -hmm. the Vogue students won't have enough time to make it up, if we were to bring students back on May 1st, they have, that'll give them 19 class days before the last day of school. And Dr. Campbell is expressing his concern that those students who are getting Fs, those students who are only with have 19 days, mm -hmm. we need to bring them back sooner. Mm -hmm. Just like the vocational students, yeah. we need to bring them back sooner yeah. to give them a chance to catch up. Yeah. 19 days won't do it. No, either way, yeah. 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 Right. Mr. Morgan? Um, I just would like to speak in support of the administration's recommendation. And to Dr. Sorensen's point, the, what we discussed on February 5th, we're, we pretty much um, met the four criteria that we had set. And I know at that time we talked about taking a vote April 5th for the 26th, but a lot of things have changed since then. Um, to, Mrs. Burge, uh, to Ms. Burgess's point, it would be good to get them in start a term, have those kids who have been struggling, and I know that I, 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 from personal experience and from I heard from other parents, there's several kids that have gone from honors to not passing courses, mm -hmm. and it's due to the hybrid model. I mean, some have excelled, mm -hmm. yeah. so you know, there's both on um, both spectrum, but I've heard from a lot of parents. So I think getting back a week beforehand will help them, and then when they come back from vacation, we we'll yeah, reduce the anxiety. Good. Plus, to your point also, Mrs. Burgess, I think going, knowing that they're in back in school, maybe they'll take more precautions when they're touring the colleges or taking their vacations, knowing that they're back in school. Yeah. You know, students, you know, we, they're split on whether they'll come back or not, but they're, you know, the high school level, they understand their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think if they don't want to ruin it for other folks, you know, I mean, things will happen, it's a pandemic, it's getting better, but it's still out there. But I think it'd be helpful to get them back that week. And the, the um, um, Department of Education is gonna give us a date soon anyways, whether it's April yeah. 28th, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it'd be May 3rd, but I think we should take a leadership decision and to bring them back when we think it's ready yeah. and not let Desi tell us when to bring them back. Bring them so back. I'm just speaking in support of my motion, I guess. Thank you. Anybody else have anything, yeah. Mr. I'm going to kind of go on the same kind of mindset that I had for our last vote, uh, for at our, what, the March, whatever, third, was that? I don't know. Um, I would like, Miss Savory would love to see the comments and to read the comments from the students and the families to give me a better idea. Not that I don't believe what was shared with us, just be, for me, it would be an added informational piece. Um, I do know that DESE is going to pick a date for us and it's going to happen and we're going to go with it and it's going to happen, but I would like to see that. I mean, the worst thing we can do is, you know, have another meeting, have a meeting next week and once we've had a chance to look at more data, but that is, that's my opinion and I'm right now we'll vote no on this, mo this motion. Right. Anybody else have anything? Did you, um, <clears throat> I just, I, my, I, I'm still kind of, there's just a lot of information that we have to absor um, absorb, and I'm wondering if we can't, like Ms. Badger said, we can, we, we can say this is gonna be the date start preparing, but have our official decision once we get a chance to do this and see how next week. Mm -hmm. Also, 
you know, we're saying that the transmission is low. And I, again, I'm playing, I'm kind of just throwing out everybody's questions that people have asked me over the week as well as some of mine. But, you know, two, like, we're saying that transmission is low, but the kids haven't gone back three feet yet. You know, and we can wait, we could not wait, the way I, I know that's a bad word, but just see how it goes when we bring the elementary school kids back mm -hmm. too and see if anything changes. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about a tiered approach, I think I was thinking more in lines of three different dates just to see how it goes. Plus the high school kids are moving around mm -hmm. where the other two groups don't go from class to class. And I think one of the biggest back. concerns I've heard from the teachers is yeah, but because we've got kids moving in and out the whole time, there's just more, there's just more going around along. It's harder to police, and and I, I agree that the kids are responsible. But I just again, I'm throwing that out there as a question. I I have no problem saying yeah, let's do that date, and let's work towards that, and let's start planning for that now, which I know you've already done. But maybe we can officially vote on it after we get a chance to absorb it a little bit more. Just want to, one yes. comment that you made in this area, I just want to clarify, our middle school does, we have a seven period scheduled, so they do change classes at the middle school. So that's, okay. I just want to as make sure As much as the high schools? Uh, eight, eight versus seven. Because oh. that, that's what I, why I'm guessing that the commissioner hasn't um, given us any No, middle schools change, no, middle schools change, most middle schools do change classes. They have, um, as, our, as does ours, um, we have a seven period schedule currently. Yeah. And I reached out to my uh, board member that I know today, and she has not answered me either to find out what, what the, if she had any insight on what the holdup is. But, all right, any other questions? I'm gonna go ahead and just take a vote. So the motion is to bring the kids back on the same day. Yeah, April 12th. Okay. And again, I think I have no problem doing that, but I, I don't wanna make the decision, I wanna, read all the data first. So, Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Ms. Badger? No. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Mrs. Burgess? Yes. Mr. Bizzano? No. Ms. Haywood? No. And I, I vote no as well, but I'm willing to revisit this at, okay. at the next meeting and still start planning for that date is my, okay. my opinion. So I don't even know what the count was. Ms. Badger? Would it be possible for us to have a meeting before our Reg regular scheduled meeting because we have to wait what that's two, it's two weeks. weeks it's two weeks till the next meeting Just what was the vote though what is it four to three we four do not uh, my we don't have a meeting until three, april yes, 5th. 5th yeah mm -hmm. All right, so the motion did not pass yes so what about the next meeting um do we are we able to schedule another meeting once we see get you know have a chance to absorb this presentation a little bit more and get the comments like in a week um, I, 20 seconds. I'm just putting it out there to you guys I mean we had the summary on dr. Campbell bias from the surveys we have the percentages we didn't see so I, the comments, I, though. I don't think it's really gonna change anything at this point I mean we didn't vote for it here unfortunately so we might as well wait to the next meeting or unless until we hear from Department of Education, if they have some more insight on the high schools, I don't see meeting next week really do anything. So I don't support meeting next week. Yeah, I, I would okay. back up Mr. Morgan because the, the other thing April 5th does, even though I, I'm, I wish we didn't have to wait another th three weeks, yeah. but since Commissioner Riley has said he's plans to announce something in April, hopefully it's not mm -hmm. mid April, hopefully it's mm -hmm. April 1st or before the 5th, we may actually have some more concrete guidance from the state by then. I mean, is it possible to like keep like he still keep that date in mind and start planning for that and that way we'll be ready to go i mean we're, just I mean, like we did with the elementary school we're we prepared started. for that date right yeah. right we are prepared for that date it's a matter of oh. letting our transportation mm -hmm. know when the that information will be something oh. that we need to figure out mm -hmm. uh specifically around transportation to, mm -hmm. to let the bus company know because that would be the last logistics because then we also have to again reach out to see who would be taking the bus uh, validate that, make sure that we have the bus assignments. Mm -hmm. That would that would take some time to do. Whether or not we could turn that around from April 5th to April 12th, I can't. But we could start I taking can't. that survey now, though, couldn't we? So I'm sorry. Hmm? We well, we have we have we've done some initial, but to finalize it, when people know that there's a decision, I don't think that we're going to have a lot of extra riders at the high school level. Mm -hmm. To be honest, our buses are, are light. 
in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ms. Burgess? Yes, I was just going to say, can't you just, once we hear from the state, can't you have the um, a special call a special meeting? Yeah. I, I assume so, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, well, it's but I mean, at whatever that the point, pleasure of the board is, I will, I will be I mean, at the it, meeting. It, it could be a quick well, meeting. also, if we hear from the state, from what I understand, you said that the, their board doesn't need to vote on it. From what I understood, what I read, we, if the state says we go back, we, don't, going back. we don't vote yeah. for we, it either, but choice. we go back. Yeah. Right. The commissioner yeah. now has the authority to make the decision. No, we yep. don't. We'll only vote if you want to go sooner. Than right. but, yeah. but absolutely yeah. start planning for it. Like, don't, you know, as, as long as everything falls into place and, I mean, I have no problem going back at that date. I just, I'm really uncomfortable. Yeah. I, yeah. Dr. Sorensen. I think that we have, uh, we have nearly 3,000 students at the secondary level in two high schools represented by perhaps, I don't know, 100, 200 families, and we didn't provide them with any guidance at this point. We told them once again we haven't been able to make the decision. So I would urge the chair to make sure that on April the 5th we vote. Mm -hmm. We must tell oh, the community we've made a decision. Mm -hmm. We can't keep putting this off. You can't, no. you can't avoid it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I just would like to second what Dr. Sorensen said. Yeah. We don't want to let our, our parents think we're letting Desi make our decision for us. No, right. and that's why I said let's plan like it's, it's going on, but it'll give us a chance to just get the additional information we need, see how it goes with the, when the, um, we'll have a w almost a week behind us with the elementary school yeah. kids in by the time we meet next. I just think it would be a, but again, that's not saying that they're not going to start on that same day. I'm just saying I. We're not gonna, in the end, we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And in the end, we don't have a choice. So. Start Thank you. So one thing I probably didn't mention too, in terms of my thinking for April 12th, um, as you know, we talked about that we have to provide a remote option for our families. Um, it's very limited at the secondary level. My reason for starting at the start of the term mm -hmm. was to provide families an option to choose something. When we, if we go to Edgenuity, for example, just to let you know, um, unless we're remoting students in, which is right now is not an option, um, Edgenuity is, a, is, a, is an asynchronous platform where students are, are self-guided and they need to do the work. Essentially, they could test out of certain things, but they're gonna be starting from square, from square one with these courses potentially and trying to finish it within a period of time mm -hmm. before the end of the term, okay? So the timeliness of that, providing, providing students whose families make that decision to have them go remote, the time to finish that work, which is now brand new. Mm -hmm. So part of my reasoning, just which I, because I didn't clarify that, uh, for April 12th was to give them a term mm -hmm. to finish that work knowing that a later date just makes that an, an additional variable, an additional factor, which gets in the way of students successfully finishing that term when they're now taking courses that are unique to what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and I, I, again, like I said, I, I don't have any, I'm personally, I don't have any problem with that. I don't know if anybody else that voted no feels, but I just think that we should. Did you have something else, Dr. Swanson? Um, so then we'll go ahead and plan on voting again uh, at our next meeting once we get what we need, right? Then we'll definitely, like you said, of course, that was the whole idea is to make sure that we make that vote. That's a given. Yeah. All right. Anything else before we move on to the next thing? All right. So next we have reports and... Time for a break, it's after. Oh, all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna take a quick five minute break. We'll come back at 9.15. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Lu Luis, they're still saying that you're
We're back. And uh, next thing is reports and proposals from the superintendent. Uh, thank you, Ms. Avery. A, a few things to report since we just met recently. Um, but <coughs> our comprehensive school health service team includes our nurses and some of our uh, clinical providers will be offering support sessions for families entitled transitioning to in-person learning, supporting K-5 families. So these sessions will be an opportunity to discuss ideas and tips to ease transition back for in-person learning, getting back to what I talked about before and, and working to support that. So we are providing, um, this is an initial two um, one hour long virtual group meetings meant to, uh, to be interactive and provide an opportunity for parents to draw support from and encourage each other. So there'll be two sessions, one March 22nd and one March 25th. Details will be going out if they haven't been done so already. One will be in the afternoon and one will be in the evening. So both sessions will take place through Zoom and invitations will go out through the schools as well as social media, what I said. I've talked a lot about farmers to families here, about the food deprivation that we see in our community and this great opportunity to um, engage with this federally supported program. So it's, it's a go. We're going to start this Saturday, actually. So we will be a distribution partner with the USDA's Farmers to Family Program, which serves all families who are facing food insecurity challenges. So as I said before, the Farmers to Family Program contains 32 pounds of perishable and non-perishable food items, including fresh fish, vegetables, dairy, pro um, fruit, vegetables, dairy products, and meat. Um, so we will be start this um, this Saturday. Um, we have surveyed our families and set a registration process. We have hundreds of families that are in need of food that have already signed up. Uh, we have a team of 40 student volunteers that we're going to be using on Saturday to start this off um, in phases. Great, great pour out of student interest in getting involved in this. Uh, the Sunrise Rotary that I'm involved in is, is expressed uh, support. So from eight o'clock until 12 o'clock, we'll be getting the food off the truck and distributing it and, and we'll be done by one o'clock. So we're gonna be doing this every Saturday for the foreseeable future. So this is wonderful, we could have 32,000 pounds of food being delivered to Plymouth North High School this Saturday, wow. boxed uh, for individual families, and, 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 and I'm really looking forward to what this will do. I think this is an awesome opportunity, not just to support our own families, but we're supporting um, uh, non-school age families that, you know, anyone in the community that is, is food deprived and needs support, our, our, our senior citizens, anyone can sign up for this and we we're really excited to bring this to plymouth really excited about this opportunity uh we'll be capturing this um this opportunity and we'll be sharing that out more and more diversity committee the diversity committee web page has been shared um it, it and it's finalized now it was important that the bylaws that we have for the diversity committee be translated in spanish and brazilian portuguese before we launched that website we wanted to make sure that everyone understood particularly our non-English speaking families. So that has been done. So now uh, that's been accomplished. So now it's live. So again, you know, the district's goal with this is to graduate confident critical thinkers, uh, engaged citizens, and it really, it, that's not possible without really a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion as well, to really have uh, thoughtful lifetime learners and students that are socially responsible. So. Um, you know, the diversity committee was established in 2020 to identify areas of equitable change, and we're really excited about the opportunities that this committee provides to our student student body as well as the district at large for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, the website is up and running, so we're happy about that, and that should help us to get some more participation. Just a reminder that next Tuesday, the last thing I have to say is uh, next Tuesday, March 23rd, at 6 p.m. We will have a joint session with the select board via Zoom. Uh, the topic will be collective bargaining. So this meeting will be held virtually for, for all of us um, and we'll get the Zoom information out to everyone the morning of the 23rd. So that's when that information will be shared with us. So again, just to mark your calendars for next Tuesday, March 23rd. And, and that's all I have this evening, Ms. Avery. Do we have a question? Yeah, the uh, the farmers. I think that's yes. awesome. Where do we uh, where do families get more information on that? 
So we pushed that out through social media. We did a, um, we did a, um, a social media blitz twice through our office, bless, bless you, to um, see who was interested. The initial response, we had over 330 families that were interested in that, and we, we pushed it out again. We also worked with the Old Colony Memorial mm -hmm. to try to get information out. And you can also go to their website. I don't have that in front of me, but we'll push that out through social media as well, through our Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter pages. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Next we have... Rip oh, sorry, um, it's, it's also on our website as well as uh, on the homepage. Thank you, Ms. Goonan. <laughs> <laughs> Committee member reports. Ms. Badger? I just have one, um, the No Place for Hate Committee, which Mrs. Haywood and I are on, um, is really excited because we're partnering with the Plymouth South High School's uh, Interact Club for Women's Hi History Month. And it's actually longer than a month in celebration, but what we're going to do is from last Friday through, I believe it's the month of May, Every Friday we'll be dropping a children's read aloud book on a woman or a group of women or um, that did something that is a good book for children. So we're really excited about being able to partner with Interact. We thankfully for our student member, Annie Yeager, put it all together. So she's done a really great job. Awesome. Any other reports and proposals? I know it's only been a week. No? Okay. And building committee? What? Building committee? Yes. Oh, I got okay. I got the floor. All right. Um, we um, we the um, the the uh, Harbor Master Building is in its final stages. There's some punch list items. Um, um, we spoke to Chad Hunter. He they're very happy in their space. Um, we talked about the um, the the fire um, the three fire station projects. And then they're, you know, they're doing the study right now. And then the assistant town manager made a mention of doing a review, having a company do a review of all the fire stations. Kind of got the impression they might look to um, close one or two of them. They, they didn't say that, but, but that's my impression. But um, that they're, they're doing all their feasibility studies, the um, structural designs and all that. So um, for the three um, fire stations that are in the queue and um, that's it. We don't really have any a lot of other projects going on. The, the North Fire Station's done. Um, and there was talk about maybe in the next few months of doing some type of event as, as the um, uh, COVID numbers go down, social distance, that maybe we can actually have a ceremony at some of these new facilities that we have in the town. Committee would like to go in and see the maritime facility. Oh, I didn't ask. Somebody might have. Somebody yeah. did. But anyway, it never happened because we couldn't have it happen. And they still even haven't had the <laughs> ribbon cutting. <laughs> they just went in. Oh, now we are. It's not we weren't on TV for oh. a little bit. Sorry. All right. I was distracted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything for old business? No? All right. New business? I think everybody's just, just exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, consent, consent agenda. Do we have a motion on the consent agenda? So I'll move. Second. All right. And second. All right, so nothing's being pulled out. So we'll go ahead and take the vote on the consent agenda. Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Ms. Badger? Yes. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Burgess? Yes. Mr. Pisano? Yes. And Ms. Haywood? Yes. And I vote yes, so the consent agenda is approved. And that is it. Can we talk about the movement I was up to say? Sorry? The meeting moving? No, we, we'll talk okay. about that. Okay, all right. All right, so it is 924 and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>